Okay, let's take a look at the first homework uh, problem for section 4.2. This is an absolutely amazing problem, all right? And again, if you can answer the problems for number three, there are a few of them here if I remember right, you've really got this function notation and operations with functions down. Now, A is pretty easy. F of one minus G of one. Well, again, if you know what f of 1 is, and you know what g of 1 is, you can subtract that and get your answer. So let's start with f of 1. And f is this piecewise linear red function right there. All right? So f of 1 would be, well, 2 right there. Minus, and then what's g of 1? Well, g is the blue piecewise linear function and it looks to me like g of 1 would be this output right there which is a 1 and 2 minus 1 equals 1 so f of 1 minus g of 1 equals 1 awesome this looks easy doesn't it part b when is f of x minus g of x positive well wouldn't that be when the graph of f of x is above the graph of g of x <clears throat> so positive implies f of x is greater than g of x. So let's find intersection points right here and then right there. Okay, <clears throat> so when x equals 0, the graphs are equal to one another. And when x equals 1, 2, 3, 4, the graphs are equal to. So it looks to me like when is f of x minus g of x positive? It would be in this interval right here. All right. Do you agree that in the open interval from 0 to 4, f of x is greater than g of x. Therefore, f of x minus g of x would have to be positive. So let's write our double inequality. So my left bound is 0. And that's an open dot, so 0 is less than x, and x is, and my right bound is open, less than, less than what number? What is that x value? 4. <coughs> All right. When is it negative? Well, then negative, what does that imply? Well, that would mean that g of x would have to be less than f of x. Excuse me, I said, I said that wrong. f of x is less than g of x, of course. Okay, so now, let's go here. So, I've got, I begin at, it looks like a negative 1, right there. And then, um, I've got this interval right here. So, how did I write that? Let's see. Yeah, I'm starting with the graph right here. All right, so do you guys agree that in the half-closed interval from negative 1 to 0, that f of x is less than g of x, therefore f of x minus g of x would have to be negative. So I'm gonna go from negative one, and now this is closed, so I'm gonna go less than or equal to x, and x is, and this is open, less than, and that x value is a zero. So in this interval right here, Negative 1 is less than or equal to x, and x is less than 0, is the interval where f of x minus g of x is negative because the f of x is below the g of x. Okay, now let's go to this endpoint right here. All right, and it looks like from this open dot to that closed dot, f of x is less than g of x. So let's do that. So what is that x value again? One, two, three, four, that's a four. So four is open dot less than x and x is closed dot less than or equal to, and what's that value? Five, six. There you go. Zero, when does f of x minus g of x equals zero? Well, that would be where we already discussed where the graphs intersect. So zero implies f of x equals g of x, okay? And that's gonna be at x equals zero. 
and at x equals, what was that again? 4. Oh, that's a great problem. What is the max of f of x minus g of x? So that would be the, the distance between f of x and g of x, where it's the greatest, and f of x, of course, has to be above g of x. So do you see this one, two, three? You see this distance right here? Do you guys all agree that that is the greatest distance between f of x and g of x, where f of x is greater than g of x? So what is that? Well, what is this magnitude right here? Well, let's see. 1, 2. The max of f of x minus g of x would be 2 units. So f minus g of 3 equals 2. And there you go. Part C. How cool. Okay, let's take a look at number 17. We're given the linear function f of x equals 2x minus 3, the rational function, which could be converted to linear rather easily because that's 1 half x plus 3 halves, but that is x plus 3 over 2 right now, and h of x equals 3x plus 2, another linear function. So those are really all three linear functions, and we need to show that f of g of x equals g of f of x for all x. Now, this is not typical, by the way, but it can happen, so they want to show you that in this case it does. So, you want to be an expert at being able to simplify composite functions. So, f of g of x. Remember, you start with your function f, which is 2 times x minus 3, but I hope you notice where the variable x is. I have a big old set of parentheses, because rather than f of x, we have f of g of x. So within this parenthesis, where the x was, we have to replace that with g of x, or x plus 3 divided by 2. Now simplify. So the 2's would cancel, leaving me x plus 3 minus 3, or x. All right. And now we've got to check for any domain restrictions. So we start, is there a restriction for any x in g of x? x plus 3 over 2 is defined for all real numbers. And 2x minus 3 is defined for all real numbers too. So there's no domain restrictions. x can be in the set of real numbers. Now, when we do the g of f of x, we have to get exactly the same thing. And we're done. So f of g of x equals. <clears throat> so now start with the function g, x plus 3 over 2. But you see where the x is? I have a big old parenthesis, and within this parenthesis, I need f of x, which is 2x minus 3. Now let's simplify this. Well, in my numerator, minus 3 plus 3 cancels, and I'm left with 2x over 2. The 2's then cancel, and I have x. And now, these are all linear functions defined for all real numbers. So there's no domain restrictions there. So x is in the set of real numbers. And that's part A. Now part B. Show that f of h of x does not equal h of f of x for any x. Oh, wow. Okay, now this is kind of rare too because usually functions intersect somewhere. But this is saying for any x. They are never going to intersect if we graph them. Well, that means we'd have to have functions that are nothing more than vertical translations of each other. So let's see if that happens here. So let's go f of h of x. So we'll start with our function f again, 2x minus 3, but see the x right there? It's now a parenthesis. And in that parenthesis, I need h of x, which is 3x plus 2. Now simplify that. Well, I see a 2 times 3x would be 6x. And then I see a 2 times 2 would be a 4 minus 3 plus 1. So there it is right there. And again, these are both linear functions defined for all real numbers. So x can be in the set of real numbers. There are no domain restrictions there. Okay. And then let's go with the h of f of x. Okay, so let's start with h, 3x plus 2, but do you see the x? It's now parentheses, because the x must be replaced with f of x, or 2x minus 3. Now again, if we distribute, we get a 3 times 2x, which is 
6x. So I have two lines with the same slope, but then I go 2 times, or 3 times negative 3 is negative 9 plus 2, that'd be minus 7. So these are two parallel lines, or a vertical translation of each other. They would never intersect. So, and again, x is in the set of real numbers, so f of h of x is parallel to h of f of x, therefore f of h of x does not equal h of f of x for any x. They will never intersect. They will never have the same value. So that's number 17. Very cool problem. All right, number 19. Given f of x equals root x, g of x equals 6x minus 3, and h of x equals x over 3, <laughs> we're going to find f of g of h of 6. Now, <laughs> what you really do here is you work inside out. So I'm going to start with f of... But what's happening inside here? Well, I have a g of, so I'll get the g, and then g of h of 6. Well, h of 6 is just a number. So what is h of 6? Well, h of 6 would be 6 over 3. That's a 2. So I'm going to put a 2 right there. And that's how you do these. This is so cool. So now I'm at f of, and then g of 2 is a number. Well, what is g of 2? g of 2 would be 6 times 2, 12 minus 3, that's a 9. f of 9. And what is f of 9? It's a number. f of 9 would equal the square root of 9, which is 3. Great problem. All right, part B. f of g of h of x. So notice above it was h of 6. So we have a number for a solution. This is now h of x, so we're just doing a double composite function. We're going to get an expression here for f of g of h of x, but we're going to work it the same way. We're going to go f of, and then g of, g of what? g of h of x. So here's the function g, which is 6 times x minus 3. But notice the x is a set of parentheses because we're not doing g of x, we're doing g of h of x. So within this parenthesis, I need the expression for h of x, which is x over 3. Now, let's simplify that. So I've got f of, and then 6 times x over 3 would be 2x, 2x minus 3. And what is f of 2x minus 3? So that just means I take the function f and I replace this x with 2x minus 3. So f of 2x minus 3 would be the square root of, and replace the x again with 2x minus 3. And now I do have a domain restriction. Make sure you always account for any domain restrictions because that's a radical and you guys know anything under the radical to be in the set of real numbers i would have to be greater than or equal to zero so 2x minus 3 has to be greater than or equal to zero so i would add 3 then divide by 2 so x is greater than or equal to added 3 divided by 2 that'd be 3 halves and there's part b that's a great problem Okay, number 21, we have the same three functions, f of x, g of x, and h of x. And first they're asking us, what is h of f of g of one half, a double composite with an input initially of one half? Now, we're going to get a number here for an output, not a function, because we have this input of one half. And I think we can probably do a little arithmetic in our head and do this whole thing in one step. So let's go, g of 1 half. Well, what is that? 6 times 1 half is 3. 3 minus 3 is 0. So now I need f of 0. What's f of 0? Well, what's the square root of 0? That's a 0. Now I need h of 0, and that would be 0 divided by 3. So h of f of g of 1 half is 0 divided by 3 or 0. That's it, A. Now part B, 
Now my input is x, so I'm going to get an expression for this double composite function right here. So we got to work inside or inside out basically, but I start my notation with h of something. h of what? h of f of g of x. So the function f of g of x, oh, I see it right now. f is just a radical, so I'm going to go a radical of g of x, which is 6x minus 3. Oh, how cool. And now I'm going to go h of root 6x minus 3 means my function h up here. I'm going to replace this x with radical 6x minus 3. And there, there it is. I can't simplify that. So ooh, we do have a radical. So we could have a domain restriction here because we know whatever is under that radical, it better be greater than or equal to 0. So 6x minus 3 has to be greater than or equal to 0. Let's solve this inequality for x. So I would add 3 and then divide by 6. So x is, I added 3, I divided by 6. 3 over 6 would be 1 half. And there is number 21. I just love these problems. All right, number 23. Oh, look at this. We have new functions, and we have four of them. All right, so f of x is x to the third, g of x is root x, h of x is x minus 4, and j of x is 2x. This is going to be fun. Express k of x. Well, I don't see a k of x. Equals 2 times the quantity x minus 4 to the third power as a composite of three of the above four functions. Wow. All right. Well, we better take this expression right here and see. We've got to start inside out. See that x minus 4 right there? Oh, that's h of x. So I'm going to work inside out, and I'm going to work a double composite equation inside out. So I'm going to start on the left with h of x, and what does h of x equal? x minus 4. There you go, right? Now, what are we doing to this x minus 4 first? Think order of operations. We're cubing. Is there a cubic function? Look at f of x. f of x equals x cubed. So if I go f of h of x, I will have x minus 4 to the third power. There, <laughs> look at that. Wow, that's cool. All right. Now, oh, I need a multiple of 2. Scalar multiple of 2 right there. So do I see a 2 times x up here? Oh, look at j right there. So if I go j of f of h of x, I will have 2 times the quantity x minus 4 to the third power. So we better put a j here and a 2 there. And my friends, I think we have it. Isn't that beautiful? That's, that's cool. Ah, oh, hey, same slide, another problem. Number 25, same four functions. And looks like the same situation, but this time k of x is nothing more than 2x minus 8 to the third power as a composite of three of the above. That's interesting. Three of the above. So let's see. That means this 2x minus 8, I don't see that above, do I? But could I write 2x minus 8? as the composite of, well, let's see, h of x and j of x. Could I start with x minus 4 and then multiply by 2? That means j of h of x. So check this out. That 2x minus 8 is nothing more than j of h of x because we start with the x minus 4 and then we multiply by 2. And now all we have to do is cube it which is f of x, so let's go f of j of h of x, and that would give us the quantity 2x minus 8 cubed. And there it is right there, number 25. All oh, these problems are rich. All right, number 33. We're just finding a couple of composites here and make sure if there are domain restri any domain restrictions, which I see g of x is a radical, so I'm betting we will have domain restrictions. Make sure you account for them. Um, might even, we're getting good at this, so I might skip a step or two, so follow along carefully. Okay, so 
f of g of x. Now, I usually go f of what here, but look it, you know, g of x is this radical function, so I'm going to start with that, and then I'm doing f of that radical function, which f is just 2 times x, so f of g of x would be 2 times this radical function. And there, there's my, my composite f of g of x. Now, because of the radical, I have a domain restriction. And with the x squared, you know, it makes it maybe a little more complicated. But I know that the 16 minus x squared is going to have to be greater than or equal to 0. Just like that. Now, so I'm thinking in my head, x squared then would be less than or equal to 16. And now I can visualize what numbers would work. What numbers can I square? and have my output be less than 16. Well, that means negative 4 to 4. Because if I square any number in this closed interval, my output will always be less than or equal to that 16 right there. If I go beyond this, like I get the 5, well, 5 squared is 25. If I have a negative 5, negative 5 squared is 25. So there is my domain restriction right there g of f of x. Let's see if we can do this the same way. Now we're starting with g, which is this radical 16 minus x squared, but you see the x right there? That now has to be 2x, but I need to square that. So that's going to give me a square of the 2, I get a 4. Square of the x, I get x squared, that's a 4x squared. All right, now I can simplify this because Look at the 16 and the 4. There's a common factor of 4 there. So if I factored that 4 out, I could bring it outside of the radical as a 2. And then what did I have left inside here when I factored out the 4? Well, that would be 16 divided by 4 is a 4 minus 4x squared divided by 4. That would be an x squared. So that's a 4 minus x squared. And now, like the last problem, I have a domain restriction because of the radical. So I know that that 4 minus x squared has to be greater than or equal to 0. So x squared is less than or equal to 4. So x would have to be between negative 2 and 2 inclusive. Negative 2, because if I square that, I get a 4. 2, because if I square that, I get a 4. If I square anything within this closed interval, I'm still going to be less than that 4. All right, so there it is right there. That's a cool problem. All right, number 35. Find f composed with g of x and g composed with f of x if f of x is x squared and g of x is root 1 minus x. All right, well, let's go f composed with g of x as f of g of x, which means... I'm going to take the function g of x, a radical function right there, and do what? f of that, well, f is a squaring function, so if I square a radical, don't I just drop the radical and get 1 minus x? All right, and because x has to be in the domain of g, that means that this 1 minus x under the radical would have to be greater than or equal to 0 and solve for x, so add x to both sides, and I see x is less than or equal to 1. All right, there's the first part. Now g of f of x. Well, this time, our input is x squared into this radical function, so I'm going to start outside with the radical, but notice, instead of g of x, I have g of f of x, so this x right here, which is that blank right there, has to become f of x, which is x squared. And there you have it. Now, of course, the radical 1 minus x squared has to be greater than or equal to 0. So that means x squared is less than or equal to 1. So I'm in the interval, close interval, negative 1 to 1. Oh, these are just cool. All right, our last pro. <laughs> wow. 37. All they give us is g of x is x plus 3 over 2. 
and now they have asked us to find g of g of 1. Okay, I can handle that. Well, I'll work inside out. g of 1 would be 1 plus 3, 4 over 2. So that's 2. So now I'm looking for g of 2, and that would be 2 plus 3, 5 over 2. So g of g of 1 is 5 over 2. Now, what is then g of g of g of 1? Well, this part right here is 5 over 2, so I'm just looking for g of 5 over 2. Oh, fractions, that's okay. g of 5 over 2, that x is a 5 over 2 plus 6 over 2, that'd be 11 over 2 divided by 2, that's 11 fourths. <laughs> <laughs> now, g of g of g of g of 1. Well, I have g of g of g of 1 is 11 fourths. So this becomes g of 11 fourths. So, let's do some arithmetic. See that x? It's now 11 over 4 plus what? 9 over 4? Excuse me. Yeah, did I do that right? No, <laughs> let's be careful. So, x is 11 over 4. And then I need a common denominator. So that's going to be a 12 over 4. So 11 over 4 plus 12 over 4. That would be 23 over 4 divided by 2. That would be 23 over 8. Wow. <laughs> that is a fun problem. All right. So that's a presentation of your homework for section 4.2. I hope you all enjoyed this stuff as much as I did.